Hello guys, welcome back. I am Dr. Anjit. I am a consultant molecular pathologist and this is one of the first lectures which I am going to shoot for the postgraduate training in pathology and I hope we will learn more and more things together. As per the request from most of the your exam going postgraduates, I am going to discuss something about HPLC here. HPLC, yes, you might get cases of HPLC and HPLC discussion is pretty common, right? And HPLC is a very simple way to interpret it. It's pure mathematics. If you know the concepts of HPLC, how to apply them, I can actually compile the entire HPLC in three tables, that's all. We'll go through the principle, we'll go through the machine, we'll go through the interpretation, and also we'll have the cases, right? So if you're ready for the game, as usual, put on a big smile and let's start learning pathology and we'll take pathology into the best level possible, right? So HPLC is your high performance liquid chromatography and not going to talk about the definition and everything. We'll start with the workflow of HPLC because as a postgraduate, you also need to know how the machine works. You also need to know how to calibrate the machine, right? So here, uh, the principle is very simple, same what you must have read in your undergraduate biochemistry. It's based on the ion charge. It's based on the movement of the ions and what goes out, what comes in. Based on that, I'm going to have a peak, right? Most of the time, the machines used in modern day pathology are based on BioRAD. We have variant and variant 2 and if you look at the thing, the I'm, I'm just going to take names, it's fine. Uh, almost entire country uses BioRAD only. So we have variant and variant 1 and variant 2 in BioRADs and there will be programs. There is something called an beta thal program, there is something called an alpha thal program, there is something called an hemoglobinopathy program, right? It's, the, it's for entire hemoglobinopathy and HPLC is also useful for HbA1c calibration, right? So all these can be done in HPLC. So when you set up a machine, if you want to run beta thal pro trait, you want to diagnose beta thal trait for a mass, you have to put the beta thal program. If you have an unknown hemoglobin number, I don't know what exactly it is, run the hemoglobin number program. These programs, the entire sample run is around six minutes. Hemoglobin number program might take a long time, around 20 minutes, maximum around 20 minutes, because it needs to look for everything. It takes a little bit of long time, that's all. It's very, very less cumbersome than your hemoglobin electrophoresis because hemoglobin electrophoresis is a bit cumbersome and is much more accurate than hemoglobin electrophoresis because I have multiple retention times, multiple windows where I can easily delineate what type of the disease it is, fine? So this is what BioRad machine looks like. You have the entire setup made here. That's your variant, right? And you'll have an interpretation and computer attached to the BioRad machine, obviously, right? So inside the BioRad machine, the variant, it looks like this, right? You can see here, there's a pump A, pump B, because they have two buffers. Actually, the buffers will be on the top of this. This is actually the BioRad buffer. It'll be top, right? And then you have the mixer, where the sample, the sample comes here, the mix, the uh, pump, the buffer A and buffer B automatically comes there, right? And this is the cartridge. The entire thing happens in the cartridge. Whatever we are going to happen, whatever is going to be there in HPLC is being done, taken care of by the cartridge. We'll look at what is cartridge and what will be there in that soon, fine? And after that, output from the cartridge will be detected by lasers, will be detected by photo detectors, which gives me the peak, okay? This is what happens here. Let me tell you how a principle of HPLC works, a simple principle, and then we'll have a quick look at cartridge, right? To understand about HPLC, actually I have two major things. First guy, it's got something called a stationary phase. Okay, I have a stationary phase, I have a mobile phase. So in HPLC, there are two guys, stationary and a mobile phase, right? So in the cartridge, in the cartridge, what we have is, it will be coated by silica. It will have silica coating on the side, along with the carboxy terminals, it will be coated there, right? Let's assume this cartridge is being coated by silica. Okay. It has the negative charge. So when I put the sample inside, that's the first stationary phase, the sample goes inside. When the sample goes into the cartridge, the hemoglobin will be stuck here because hemoglobin has the positive charge and the silica has a negative charge, right? So there'll be negative charge in the silica and the positive charge in the hemoglobin, the molecule goes and stuck here. That's a stationary phase. It'll always be stuck. And the sticking the, of the molecule is based on the charge, more affinity and less affinity, right? If it has more charge, it'll bind so tight. Less, less charge, it'll bind less tight, right? Then comes your mobile phase. So in mobile phase, what I do is, that's where your buffers come inside. So I'm going to push in the buffer. The buffer is also going to have a positive charge, right? So what the buffer does is, this buffer has a little bit more positive charge than the hemoglobin. We know the charge of hemoglobin of almost every variant of hemoglobin we know. So I've created a buffer that's a little bit more stronger than hemoglobin. So what I do is, I'm going to flush the cartridge with the buffer with more charge. I'm having more negative charge. So can I say this buffer will go and hit this hemoglobin and replace this guy? 
possible right so then what happens is this hemoglobin comes outside it goes outside it passes via a detector and the detector will detect okay hemoglobin molecule has come so it's going to produce a peak simple what determines which peak comes first which peaks goes later is the affinity let's assume i'm having two molecules two variants of hemoglobin one is tightly bound one is little bit loosely bound i am putting in a buffer who will going out first the one with loose binding that guy will go out first that produces a peak after some time i still keep on pushing this guy more and more and more buffer buffer will definitely replace because buffer is more stronger than the hemoglobin right after some time this guy with strong binding to your cartridge also will go go outside so you'll have different peaks based on the charge of the hemoglobin variance hbf has a different peak a has a different peak a2 has a different peak because everything molecular wise is a different charge right i hope you understood the basic principle of your simplest principle of hplc it's stationary phase where the affinity hemoglobin goes and binds to the cartridge mobile phase where it flush with the buffer simple right and whenever every hemoglobin molecule goes outside it will produce a peak that's what how hemoglobin alpha forces or sorry hplc happens right now let's have a look at this this is what the cartridge is about this this is the only tiny thing it's very very tiny the entire thing of hemoglobin uh, hplc happens in the cartridge right so if you look at this this is what the cartridge has it has the carboxy terminal silica which is a negative charge my hemoglobin comes and binds to it like i said so this is my stationary phase right so once i flush with buffer the buffer goes buffer slowly displaces all the hemoglobin based on the affinity less affinity easily displaced more affinity to negative charge it will take time to display but the entire displacement happens within 6 minutes 5.5 approximately beyond that no hemoglobin can stay in the mobile phase it everything will be displaced that's why i said that uh, the variance uh, your beta tal and alpha tal program runs for maximum 6 minutes everything will be flushed out and have a beautiful curve at the end of 6 minutes every time a hemoglobin comes produce a peak produce a peak produce a peak produce a peak it produces peaks like this then we can easily interpret that right so this is the principle of hplc so now once i know the principle rest everything is easy for us right we know the principle now we'll go and have a quick look about few of the important times here few of the important terminologies here we have something called as void time retention time windows and area under the curve i want you guys to pay utmost attention to this because this is the basic for my interpretation right if you have any doubts in this you can ping me at any point of time i'll try to explain to you again fine so here let me draw a curve so i said that it will be producing a curve right the detector will produce a curve here i have x axis and y axis x axis is the percentage sorry y axis is the percentage like usual the x axis has something called as retention time okay they're going to have something called as retention time so what happens here is i will have a peak let me draw a peak and let's see what these are exactly mean right so let's assume i'm having a peak like this the topmost thing is obviously the percentage let's say if it's 50 percentage okay that's a peak there right that's a peak there fine okay so here that's that's just the peak ignore it i'll we'll come to it again so here i'm using a different color here let's say this entire thing so i'm having a curve for this big duration right this entire thing is called as an window we we'll look at multiple windows there's something called as p1 p2 p3 a0 a2 multiple windows are there the entire thing is a window from the start to the end is the window retention time means i have a peak right so let's let's draw a line from the peak okay it should be a straight line yes let's draw a straight line from the peak and then from this point see this is 0 minute from the center of the peak from the starting point this time is called as an retention time please be very careful window and retention time is not the same window is a range retention time may be in the mid of the range i want you guys to look at both of them in a hplc graph because both are different let's say i'm having a, a let's say a window of 2 3 to 4 minutes that's a window fine and i'm producing one in one case i'm having the peak around 3.2 minutes the peak happens immediately in the second case i had the peak let's say around uh, 3.8 minutes so in the second patient the retention time is 3.8 but the window is same 3 to 4 but here the retention time is 3.2 but window is same 3 to 4 
right so window can be the same but i can have multiple retention times which is very very important for me to have differential diagnosis on hplc graphs right i hope you understood the entire thing is the window and the peak wherever it's produced that time is your retention time and retention time can vary fine next white time so what do you mean by white time is in the initial 0.63 minutes or 63 seconds nothing will be detected that's white time you might have peaks but i will not be able to quantify it that's an inherent problem of hplc in the initial thing for 0.63 minutes i'll show you a uh, table with everything required for you there for the initial 0.363 minutes i will not be able to quantify it i might have peaks but i won't be able to quantify it we'll use that for one diagnosis we'll see that soon fine next is area under the curve we know window we know retention time we know what is void time now area under the curve right so area under the curve is, let me draw one more thing because area under the curve is very very important because you might miss it out on a superficial look let's say i'm having a peak like this okay very thin peak okay at the same time i'm having a very broad guy right so this area under the curve that's area under the curve right can i say let's make mark it b and a a definitely will have very less area under the curve compared to b obviously right so this area under the curve gives the percentage of hemoglobin don't look at the peak peak is different area under the curve gives the percentage of hemoglobin so obviously a percentage of hemoglobin will be totally different from the b curve of percentage of hemoglobin because generally when it's a first timer you look at the peaks and say okay both are 50 50% never like that it's the area under the curve which determines the percentage i'll show in hplc so that we can apply this that's very very important look at this okay superficially looking this and this has almost same peak right don't interpret them as same amount of percentage of hemoglobin look at this hemoglobin f is just 18.9 percentage that's all this is actually s window s window look at that 70 percentage it's the area under the curve which determines the percentage not the peak please be very very careful about that peak might be same both of them might look tall but the area under the curve is different right it doesn't mean these both are equal it's the area which matters and always look at the percentage than looking at the graph the percentage gives more information about hplc than the graph per se fine great so it's the first thing so we know retention time we know void time we know area, area under the curve and also we know about windows so how many windows are there like you can see you can see the timeline right up to six minutes generally most of the hplcs will be done only for six minutes after that the graph comes outside right so here there are multiple timelines right this is a very very important table F unfortunately for a post graduation you have to memorize this but when you become a consultant every kit you have will have this table take a big printer and stick it there that's there that should be there because i need not memorize the retention time of every peak at least for an under postgraduate level in an exam people do expect this unfortunately remember this 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 because these three are the ones which are commonly comes right a a0 that's hemoglobin a a2 as well as your s window so these are the s windows this is what i call as pre integration or the void time i won't have any peaks at the void time i cannot quantify but if you have a peak in the white time very very early think of hemoglobin h or hemoglobin bats alpha thalassemia right think of that if you have something in the pre integration place right p1 there'll be no hemoglobin eluted in p1 pf is the next window hemoglobin f that's all in p2 this is just for hba one c if you have a program of hplc running for hba one c that comes in the p2 window and you can easily quantify the p2 window obviously hemoglobin hope is very very rare ignore that it will not be asked for exams fine p3 window is where i have hemoglobin j mirrored again a rare finding that's why i said me not know much about it a a0 window please know this this i want my postgraduate to know at least like i said i want three things for my postgraduate to know the written window of 1.93 minute and 3.10 minute is for hemoglobin a and adult hemoglobin f i want you guys to know 0.96 to 1.2 is for hemoglobin f then i want to know a2 as well not just a2 a2 has 3.3 to 3.9 and all these guys will elute only in the a2 window and how the hell will i differentiate that's where the concept of retention time comes we'll see that very soon right all this hemoglobin a2 hemoglobin lepore hemoglobin d iran and hemoglobin e all of these guys will come under the a2 window of 3.3 to 3.9 minutes fine 
okay and hemoglobin d has a separate window if you remember great forget no issues hemoglobin s this i want you to remember again it's fantastic postgraduate right you have to at least pick up sickle cell anemia hemoglobin s again q and a dash or a2 prime this i want you to remember in hemoglobin s a2 prime is also a component it also eludes there why this is important is let's assume i'm having a patient with beta thalassemia trait generally we quantify trait based on the a2 levels right more than 3.5 we think of trait or more than 3.9 we think of trait right sometimes rarely clinically everything like a trait microscopy i'm having target cells my rdw menster's index everything is such to of trait but in hplc hemoglobin a2 this a2 window will not be up to 3.5 or up to 3.9 let's say it's only 3 in that condition hemoglobin a2 levels is always a2 percentage plus a2 prime percentage that's very important let's assume in a hplc you had an a2 and you had an a2 prime also a2 it said like 3.2 and a2 prime is like 0.8 and a2 prime comes in hemoglobin s in s window a2 prime comes now and when i cal calculate hemoglobin a2 levels i am going to say it's 3.2 plus 0.8 it's 4 which is significant for me you might miss this an inexperienced person you might definitely miss this look out for this look out for s2 whenever yes or the a2 prime whenever you are interpreting for beta thalassemia trait very very important and entire a2 levels is both of them calculated together fine great i'll come back and i have something called an unknown window it's not named i have that hbq fine and i have a c window c is very very unlikely because in india we don't have hemoglobin c at all right this is an important table that's the first important table which you're going to learn fine next like i said my a2 window is a2 you can see lepore d iran and hemoglobin e how the hell will i differentiate them that's where your concept of retention time comes this is the retention time value in my uh, lab hplc it might slightly vary from different different providers different different reagents so don't go with the same retention time it might be have a slight variation right so wh- why this retention time is important is let's say i'm having an a2 window here the two a2 windows both of them are in the a2 window only it looks like hemoglobin a2 right i will think of hemoglobin a2 only but let's say once retention time rt's retention time is 3.65 the other guy's retention time is let's say 3.5 the first guy is hemoglobin a2 the second guy is lepore that's how it helps right when your retention time is important not just the window if the window is in a2 i think of these four look at the retention time exactly you'll know what i'm dealing with because both will have the same place peak so this table is important for me so for me to differentiate any all of these i need to know the retention time of that this the values which i gave is the template in my lab in my machine the retention time will vary based on the lab and based on slight subtle variation will be there right perfect so again to know it is d punjab or g philadelphia if you know the retention time i can easily differentiate them right that's required for you that's a application of knowing retention time and the difference between window and retention time fine great so i know one half of it now let's see see this what i want you to remember when you have 22 to 40 percentage in the d window think of d punjab heterozygous this percentage is important when do i call it as heterozygous when do i call it homozygous for d yes as well as c up to 40 is heterozygous this is what you read in robbins as well right hemoglobin s of up to 40 hemoglobin a is heterozygous anything above that 70 to 90 most of them is going to be homozygous very very important is this less than 10 if you have a peak it's not suggestive of an sickle cell anemia in s window if you have a peak of less than 2 it's something else not suggestive of sickle cell anemia remember that less than 10 i generally don't take much into consideration some elution or maybe in s window it could be in a2 prime so do add it there right so you have to interpret very carefully only when it goes above 22% for d s and c window it is significant for the disease otherwise something else in an unknown window less than 10 is not significant it's not significant at all it said in few books like less than 7 not significant 7 to 10 intermediate alkyne consider less than 10 not significant more than 
Yes, in a, in, this is for the unknown window. For D, it's a different percentage. For unknown window, it's a different percentage. Here, more than 10. Yes, it's significant. We have to look what it is. Right? We, we have the uh, table. It's going to be hemoglobin Q. Most likely that. In an unknown window. Fine. Great. Look at this. So look at this value. Uh, I want both the percentages as well as ret retention time. Right? Hemoglobin F is 91 percentage. Wow. Hemoglobin A2 is 2.4 percentage. And hemoglobin A is 2.4 percent. Hemoglobin A is 6. 6.7 percentage. Right? So if I have such a huge HBF, what do I think of? Like I said, entire HPLCB can be combined in three tables. The first is the first one. This is next I want you to remember. Whenever HBF is to be interpreted, look at this. Look at this thing. Take a printout of this and paste it somewhere, right? Less than five. Most likely can be normal or a variation of your pregnancy or some other aplastic anemia, pancytopenia, oxygen deficiency. HBF will be elevated slightly. Smoker, it will be elevated for sure. Some deficiency is a pregnancy or a normal. Up to five. Don't care much about it, right? 5 to 15, think of beta thalassemia trait. 15 to 45, beta thalassemia homozygous. You must have seen that both of them, I am writing beta thalassemia homozygous, right? Anything more than 15, I am considering abnormal. Why I am having more than 90 also and 15 to 45 also beta thal homozygous? If you remember beta thal homozygous, I can have beta 0, beta 0. I can have beta 0, beta plus. I can have beta plus, beta plus. Right? These are the variations. So definitely this will have worst clinical scenario and definitely HBF will be very very high. This is also major but not that worse. So only I am writing your 15 to 45 also think of beta thal major, more than 90 also think of beta thal major. Again 15 to 45 think of one more disease. Hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin is also. Hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin. Right? That's very very important. It's FH, ignore that typo, right? It's persistent fetal hemoglobin. That's an important condition. Again, 15 to 45 heterozygous, more than 90 homozygous, right? This is what you're going to see if hemoglobin F is very prominent. Next important curve for me, as a third important curve is this guy. Chota one, right? Look at this. 5.1. Abnormal for sure. So how do I interpret? It's very, very important to interpret HbA2. If you know the, whatever I'm going to tell in the next few minutes, it is more or less sorted. Definitely more or less sorted, right? Look at this. The normal value is less than 3.5. It's 2 to 3.5 is a normal value. If you have anything less than 3.5, think about these two. One is normal. This is very, very important. Alpha thal will have HP A2 of like 1 or 1.5. It will be very, very low. Less than 3.5, looking at the clinical scenario, either normal or think of alpha thal. Because alpha thal will have microcytic anemia, right? Anyway, I'll definitely give me a clue. 3.5 to 3.9. This, in India, it's a huge trouble. Generally, what textbook says, above 3.9 in India is definitely beta thalassemia. Trait. I'm going to think of that. But iron deficiency anemia is one of the major and the most important confounding factor. In IDA, HbA2 obviously will slightly decrease. And obviously, thal and IDA can easily coexist in our country. So whenever you have 3.5 to 3.9, it's the cat on the wall. Look for ferritin levels. If ferritin is low, replace them and then go for repeat HPLC. Or take a risk and say, yes, this patient is having beta thalassemia trait, right? So this part is very, very important. I would want you to take an individualized decision. I would say, to be on a safer side, treat the patient, correct iron deficiency anemia, and if, if you want, repeat the HPLC to be perfectly correct, right? But 3.5 to 3.9, think of beta thal. 3.9 and above. Till 9 percentage is undoubtedly beta thal trait. There's only one guy here. That's an important thing. More than 9 percentage. Most of the time, more than 9 percentage, or even like 3.9 to 9 also, I might think of this. In the A2 window, Lepore was there, right? HBE was there, and HBD Iran was there, right? So if it's more than 9 percentage of HBA2, it is not A2. It is other guys in the window. So how do I differentiate these guys? You go back to your that's it guy. You go back to your retention time. A2 cannot be more than 9 even in thalassemia trait. If it's more than 9, like 30-40%, it's something other guys masquerading as A2 in the A2 window. So I look for the retention time and I'll know what it is. Actually, e and HB A2 in retention time is very less. You cannot differentiate that ideally, right? 
3.62 difficult. But Lepore and HBE, yes, definitely you can differentiate based on retention time. That's what you're going to think of whenever you have an A2 value. I have given all the basic necessary things for you. We know what is retention time. We know all the windows and we know what is what all there is in, there in every window. We know the variance of HBF and we know the variance of HBA2. That's enough. All these are informations. You're going to apply them and you're going to come to a diagnosis. It's simple application and always before inter interpretation in your practice, ask for history. Without patients, we are nothing. You might be in the lab diagnosis, but without patients, we are all zero. Please ask for history. Then please do ask for CBC as well. That's very, very important because I can have lots of variation. We'll look at the, all the variations very soon. I have close to nine cases. We'll discuss all of them and you guys are going to answer each and everything. I'll give you subtle hints and subtle clues. That's all. And always think of IDA when you're having a beta thal because the variation of HBA2 is very, very common in India. Please think of IDA when a clinical history suggests to have beta thalassemia. Fine. Great. Next. That's a normal HPLC. Perfectly normal HPLC. Look at the A2. Less than 3.5. Normal. I'm not going to think of the beta thalassemia, alpha thalassemia here. It's a normal HPLC. HBA is superb and fetal hemoglobin is almost nil, almost zero. That's how a normal HPLC is, right? This is the area under the curve. Area under the curve is not equal to the peak. Remember that, fine? Okay. Now, since you know normal, let's go to abnormality. Abnormality is a beauty. If you know normal, abnormality is definitely, definitely easy for us, right? Let's go ahead. First case. It's a 22-year-old person with fatigue and with microcytic anemia. That's a very simple one, right? Very simple and straightforward. Let's look at the HPLC. Microcytic anemia, clinically history of fatigue, right? This is HPLC. Okay. Look at this. I'm having a hemoglobin F of 1.8. Can I tell it as a normal? Normal, right? Hemoglobin A of 81.7. I'm just writing it bigger because it's very, very tiny. If you can't see that. Hemoglobin A of 81.7. Hemoglobin A2 of 5.6. Please don't confuse percentage with retention time. Don't write 3.63 hemoglobin F A2 and it's normal. No. Hemoglobin A2 here is 5.6. This is percentage. The second column is your retention time. Right? Please be very careful about it. A2 of 5.6. Possibilities? I have only one guy, right? Just now we saw. If it is 3.9 to 9, I think of only one person, beta thalassemia trait. That's a classical case of beta thal trait, right? It's beta thal trait. And obviously the clinical history, 22-year-old person, obviously not major, right? Presenting with microcytic anemia. My menstrual index and your RDW will also help in this patient, fine? We are done with one guy, right? Next. There are simple cases. I just want you to apply the three tables. The window table. HBF table, HBA2 table, and subtle variations in the clinical history, fine? Look at this. 34-year-old person with Azam, a chronic low-grade anemia, right? Let's see what's, what's happening here, fine? F and A2. Like I said, never ever go for the peak. Look at the F level. HBF is 11.7 here. HBA2 is 26.8 here. And HBA is 51.3 here. Perfect. Now, if you remember the A2 table, I said that when A2 is more than 9, it is actually not A2. Someone is masquerading as A2. Might be a Lepore. Might be your DE RAN. Right? Might be your E. Right? All of them are possibilities. Right? And this here, you have a retention time of 3.66. 3.65, 3.62 is where I'll just go up once again. Fine? Okay, we have this. These are three possibilities for me, HBE, HB Lepore, and HBDE RAN, right? And HBE, in, in this, uh, this was given by my one of my close uh, friends and my senior, Dr. Bishujit, who works in Negrims, like it is given, shared by him, right? So here, this tiny thing, like your 366, 3.66 is my retention time here. Retention time, like I said, it's calibrated based on the machine. The machine calibration of 3.6 is retention time for this particular case was equivalent to HBE. So we have reported that they have reported that as HBE plus abnormally elevated HBF. And I do have good quantities of HBA, right? So this HBE heterozygous or homozygous? Obviously it's heterozygous, right? It's heterozygous. It's simple. Look at the three tables, that's all. Here I had someone in the A2 window more than 9 percentage. 
So if it's more than nine percentage, I think of these three guys. To remember what is exactly those three guys, we look at the retention time. Like I said, retention time varies. I gave you an example of 3.73 is retention time for um, my lab. This lab's 3.66, the retention time was for HBE. So we reported that as HBE heterozygotes. So retention time, you need not memorize much. But I would still say, you can still report it as either one of these. DD is enough. In an exam, this DD is more than enough for you to come to a conclusion. Actually, I will tell you can confidently say HBE only. D Iran is a bit rare, okay? And Lepor I'll show you. Lepor has a very classical finding. That's why it's more or less HBE. You keep seeing more HPLC, you'll be like, okay, HBE. A2 is elevated, has to be the either of this guy. D Iran, bit rare. And Lepor has a very unique finding. We'll look at that soon, fine? Third case. Four-year-old kid requiring anemia and blood transfusion. Right? Requiring blood transfusion, having anemia, fine? Ah, look at the peak. Hemoglobin F is 93.7 percentage. F more than 90 percentage. I have only two differential diagnoses. Hereditary persistence of he fetal hemoglobin homozygous or beta thalassemia major. I have only two differential diagnoses, right? These were the things, right? These are only two differential diagnoses for me. Now tell me, how will you differentiate this? It's very, very simple. I go for the history. Persistent hemoglobin F are most likely asymptomatic. They are most likely asymptomatic, fine. This kid was four year old and required blood transfusion. Obviously, it's going to be beta thal homozygous or beta thal major, right? I'll go back again. A2 is very minimal. A is almost minimal, right? Very, very less. Entire thing is being replaced by HBF. That's such a severe hemolytic anemia. Everything is replaced by HBF because I don't have beta chain at all, right? It's going to produce more and more in HBF in order to sustain, fine? Okay, that's what happens in your beta thal major. That's HPLC classical for beta thal major, right? Okay, next. Case 4. 20 year old fatigue, recurrent abdomen pain and CBC showed microcytic anemia. That's a very interesting case. This is where I am going to relate your clinical picture and your HPLC. Superficially, looking at the HPLC, it looks very decent, right? I'll, uh, again, don't look for the peaks, always look for the percentage. HBS, in the S window, I have 70.4% 70 per 70 and in HBA2, I have 5.4% and HBF, I have 18.9%. Though the peaks are more or less same, S is 70% and F is only 18.9%. So, by default, I will jump to a diagnosis of HBS. Heterozygous or homozygous? I'll think of an homozygous HBF, right? Because if you look at this guy, abdomen pain, recurrent abdomen pain, right? And sickling will also, test also will help me. Clinical severity also will help me, right? I have HBS for sure here. That's not the concern here. The misfit is the concern. Sickle cell anemia produces normocytic anemia, not microcytic anemia. That's why it should always be correlated. Don't jump on the clinical picture, your HPLC report alone. I need clinical imaging also. I need to integrate. I won't have microcytic anemia in case of a sickle cell anemia. So revisit the HPLC graph again. I'll go back again. What's happening? A2 is elevated or normal? A2 is elevated. So is there a possibility that this can be both beta thalassemia plus sickle cell anemia? Yes. So it's a classical case of sickle beta you have to interpret each and everything right like i said i need the window i need to interpret hba2 separately i need to interpret hbs separately and obviously other windows it's hbs with beta thalassemia this also can be picked up on hplc with simple information needed for you clinically it's not matching so it's something abnormal right great case number five this also is from Northeast, right? Look at this case. It's a beautiful case. I'm zooming it up. I have a peak here. Like I said, what's more important for me is the S window. In S window, I have 85%. So superficially looking, this should be looking like an homozygous sickle cell anemia, right? So we thought of an homozygous sickle cell anemia. I'll tell where we landed up in trouble. So what we had was, we looked at the patient. Patient was asymptomatic. Patient had a hemoglobin of 10.9 or something. No vasoclusive crisis, nothing. Sickling test was done. Sickling didn't happen. 
for a homozygous sickle cell anemia sickling should happen immediately right actually sickle cell should be said there an rbc in the peripheral smear i don't want to do even a sickling test even after doing sickling test the rbc is didn't sickle but i am having hbs of so high hbs so what we did was we broke ahead for quite some time and then we noticed a very very subtle but a very important finding there right that's why i say interpret everything continuously and also the patient is microcytic again sickle cell anemia cannot be microcytic right what we did was we looked at it again s window 85% retention time of 4.17 we'll go back to a table once right the table where i had uh, written all the retention time right look at this s should not come beyond before 4.3 which means this is a machine error so it's actually not s the retention time is something abnormal and my machine has abnormally picked it as hbs so what we did was we recalibrated the machine we did the calibration again we did uh, control is very very important calibration is very very important because all these are machine based diagnosis if your machine screws up your diagnosis is gone right so we recalibrated the machine because this shouldn't happen after recalibration what had happened was it showed a d window this was hbd because 4.1 it should be in this window right so as a hbd panja d panja will have microcytic anemia d panja will not have sickling crisis d panja will not have your sickle cells in your sickling test as well right this also is very important the take home message of this case is don't blindly look at the machine don't blindly believe the machine don't look superficially look at every nuances you are going to have insane observation skills in future that's what makes you from a normal pathologist to a top notch pathologist observe each and everything you should have an eye for a detail first thing look at the percentages next look at the retention time matching or not not matching recalibrate redo again matching then look at your peaks a2 i have three probabilities four, four probabilities f i have three four probabilities and if it is in that window what retention time come to an answer plus the most important thing it should match clinically it's not matching clinically i'm definitely doing some error right great next case is a 22 year old male uh, with complaints of fatigue cbc showed on microcytic anemia okay hi microcytic hypochromic anemia right this hplc hplc had a hemoglobin a of 93.7 decent right f is there 0.2 again decent a2 1.6 this is a problem 1.6 is very very low right it's around 2.5 to 3.5 is where normal but still i told you if there is a anything of hb a2 of less than 3.5 one think of normal second perfect think of alpha thalassemia great see alpha thalassemia uh, you have four different types one gene deletion two gene deletion three and four one and two gene deletion will not cause symptomatic anemia this patient had a symptomatic anemia microscopy had microcytic anemia so i have only two possibilities i can have hbh or your hemoglobin bards these are only two alpha thalassemia which can cause symptoms other two two will be asymptomatic you cannot you can't even differentiate them like i told in hplc there is something called as void time or pre integration time and these two guys will be having peak in the pre integration time let's go back and look at the graph once again i am sure you must have missed it look at this graph you have a peak here <laughs> this is first minute second minute third minute you have two subtle peaks before the first minute these are in the void time which means i am having either hbh or hb bards here bards will not be bards is going to be in the intrauterine life right it will not be presenting in 20 uh, 22 year old person So it's HBH disease. So I have to prove HBH disease. I have two modalities. Either you can redo an alkaline electrophoresis, which we didn't have. So we did a simple thing. What's this? Gold ball inclusions, right? The classical gold ball inclusions seen in your HBH disease. This in your brilliant crystal blue strain, or even in your uh, normal new metal blue strain, you can see that, right? It's a simple thing. Gold ball inclusion. The take-home message here is again: look at every component, not just a. not just a2 not just s even before 1 minute the curves are important for me i cannot quantify them but that's important for me and again a2 interpretation will lead me there like i said only three things are needed for me 
the windows a2 levels f levels it will definitely take me to the place what I, what is the destination here right so this was an hemoglobin hbh disease alpha thalassemia and we did prove it with your golf ball inclusions right next case it's very interesting and simple right i know it's simple difficulty is there only in the head once we know it once we clearly know what we want we can easily interpret and post exam you finish your md pathology take the screenshots of those three things and stick in your lab you can diagnose HPLC forever in your life, right? 35 year old, fatigue, hemoglobin levels are low, iron studies were normal. Okay, iron studies normal, fine. Let's go ahead, look at it. A2 of 3 percentage. Decent, but little bit on the lesser side, fine. HBA of 71.1. HBF is almost zero. I have an unknown peak. Unknown of 18.2. See, when it's unknown, of more than 10 percentage I said it's significant so something wrong is happening so I'm having a peak in the unknown window and in unknown window we had only one guy right let me go back to the table again like I said this table is very very important for me so if you look at the unknown window I have only one guy which is HBQ in here though it's a very very rare condition but if you have peak in the unknown that's called as why I put this case it's not my case it's from the internet obviously so this is uh, this I have put because this is a very important viva question this is called an Church spike, church spike appearance. Looks like a church spike. Q India will have extremely, extremely narrow the church spike pattern. Okay, that's a very, very classical pattern for HBQ. Remember that, and it will be in the unknown window. It will neither be any of the known windows. Fine. It's just for this I put it there. Okay. Eighth case. This was a very, very interesting case. It's a patient with fatigue. I don't know the age. I forgot it. Right. If you look at this, I'm having some abnormality in HbA2 window, right? A is also less. F is actually way high and I'm having some problem near HbA2 window, right? In HbA2, it's actually a bit of a complicated case. I am not going to consider F here. The HbA2 is the only thing which is important for me. I'll discuss about HbA2 here, right? So this HbA2, I'm having 6%, which means I'm going to think of beta tal. But that's not my only consideration here. Look at the HBA2 curve. We'll look at other curves and we'll then compare with this. HBA2, smooth, like a Gaussian distribution, normal curve, right? HBA2, though it's less, smooth. Look at the HBA2, smooth. Wherever we had, till now, HBA2 was smooth. It went up, it came down. But in that case, HBA2 was not smooth. It had a piggyback. It's looking like something different. It's having like this this climbing thing right it's like a waveform this waveform of HBA2 is very 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 classical for lepore it's a very complicated lepore I'm not going into the exact diagnosis here I just want you to remember lepore here so because in HBA2 I can have A2 I can have DE run I can have lepore I can have HBE if you remember we saw HBE that time I told you Lepore will have a very classical pattern. I won't confuse at all. That's why in that a normal peak in HBA2 of more than 9 percentage, I have only two possibilities. Either E or your D Iran. And E will be most likely D Iran, but unlikely in our, in, in our country, right? Okay. So this piggybacking appearance is diagnostic of a Lepore. Always look for this. This might come in an exam case because people want to show off, right? Okay, this part we'll discuss sometime down the road in a di case discussion. Why this variation is there? Because Lepore might not have such a high of 79.3 percentage of your HPF. Right? Well, there's a possible, there's a reason here. We'll discuss sometime down the road. Fine. Okay. Last but not the least, just last case. And I'm boring you a little bit with too many cases, but unless you see many many cases, it'll be very difficult for you to interpret them. They're very very difficult for you to apply them. Right. So it's a very simple one. I'm just going to show you only one thing here. This will not be seen in India. I just want to complete that's all. C window as 11.5. 11.5 percentage in C window. I'm going to think of HBC. This is not from our country. It's from a um, foreigner who was diagnosed here. HBC is unlikely for an, a very, very unlikely seen in Indian, right? It's a classical picture of HBC, the spike. Fine. That's HBC because we have seen abnormalities in the S window. We have seen abnormalities in the A2 window. We have seen abnormalities in the F window also. This is the abnormality in the C window for HBC. And we have something called as HBO Indonesia, which also can present like this, right? Okay, great. So that's about it. Like I said, there are only three tables needed for me. This table, 
I want you guys at least to memorize foreign postgraduate exam. Memorize this guy. This, this, at least this. And I definitely want you to know the abnormalities of HBF, when to think of what. And I definitely want you to know the abnormalities of HBA too, when to think of what, right? These are very, very important, okay? I hope it is fun. I hope it is fun interpreting HPLC. HPLC is very simple to interpret. There are lots and lots of books. I would recommend Barbara Bain. It's a very, very good book for hemoglobinopathies as well. For most of the hematology, Barbara Bain's manual are extremely amazing, right? If you have time after your exams, please go and read back Barbara Bain, right? So that's for today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your valuable time. And I hope it was interesting. So do give me constructive feedbacks because first time I'm exploring teaching for post-graduation. If it's working, we'll continue the same thing and we'll learn more and more things together. See you soon. Till then, bye-bye from Dr. Ranjit. Bye-bye.